We are on an aggressive path of raising interest rates to tap the brakes on the economy. I'm confident you know, we are going to get control of inflation and bring it back down to 2%. Whether that leads to a recession, I don't know. It's really going to depend on do we get some help from the supply side that has been gummed up because of COVID, because of Russia invading Ukraine and these other external factors. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute. And today I'm speaking with Neil Kashkari. Neil has been president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis since January 1st, 2016. Before joining the Minneapolis Fed, he ran for governor of California in 2014 on a platform focused on economic opportunity. He worked closely with me at the U.S. Department of Treasury and oversaw the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, during the financial crisis. Previously, Neil was an aerospace engineer developing technology for NASA missions and worked at Goldman Sachs' Menlo Park office. Neil, I'm grateful for the important role you played at Treasury working with me during the financial crisis and for your work at the Fed. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Let's get started. You were born and raised in Akron, Ohio, the son of two highly educated immigrants from India. Neil, talk a bit about what it was like growing up in your family in Akron. You know, in Akron, it was a pretty typical suburb in America, but we had a very rich community of Indian immigrants. You know, my dad was a professor of engineering at the University of Akron. My mom was a doctor at the local community hospital. There were a lot of other Indian doctors and professors around. And so I grew up with my friends were the children of those doctors, those professionals. So there was a keen focus on education and in our very close-knit community. And so you then followed in your father's footsteps going on in engineering. So you went on to earn a master's in engineering at the University of Illinois. Were there any experiences there that were fundamental to your career progress? Uh, Absolutely, you know, I was, uh, there was a project, a student project to build a solar powered car and race it across the country. And I participated in the first version when I was a senior. And then when I was a grad student, I led the project. And there was about 100 or so students building this car and racing it across the country. It was my first real leadership experience. We made tons of, I made tons of mistakes. Uh, right now, I you know kick myself with some of the stupid things that I did. But it was my first real leadership experience. And I'm, I feel so lucky to have had it at such a young age. So as I recall, then, you spent a couple of years in the defense industry. And you went to Wharton Business School before taking a job in the Menlo Park office of Goldman Sachs where you worked with technology clients. Neil, you first came to my attention when the partner who ran the area called me and asked if I could help him support your application to become a White House fellow. I was a CEO of the firm at the time, and I was a bit taken back that he had such a high regard for you, but he was working to help you leave. So I asked him what was going on. But what made you decide you wanted to leave Goldman Sachs to go to Washington and work on public policy? You know, ever since I was a kid, I remember watching the Sunday morning shows with my father. I was intrigued by government. I didn't really understand it. It it seemed exciting, seemed like something I wanted to learn about. And I became aware of the White House Fellowship, and I thought this would be a great chance to go take a year, go into Washington, learn about government, and, you know, maybe come back to Goldman Sachs afterwards. So I was really happy that the leaders that I worked for supported me and were encouraging me. They didn't want me to leave but they wanted me to get the experience. And so I was really grateful that they were willing to reach out to you on on my behalf. And you were turned down. It turned out to be advantageous to me and to the government that you were turned down. But the next time I heard from you was shortly after I was nominated to become Treasury Secretary. And you called me to offer your services in Washington. Do you remember what my answer was? At the time, I left you a voicemail and I said, Hank, I don't know if you remember me, but I applied for this White House fellowship. I didn't get it. I want to come work for you. I don't care if I'm going to lick envelopes. I just want a chance to serve. And I remember the first voicemail I got back from you was like, okay, thanks for reaching out. I'm really focused on my confirmation. I got to get through my confirmation. I'll be back in touch. 
But then a couple of days later, I heard from your assistant who said, hey, he wants to, Hank wants to chat with you. And that's when I said to her, I said, well, where is Hank right now? And she's like, well, he's in Washington working on his confirmation. And I said, you know, it just so happens I'm going to be in Washington tomorrow. And so I had to negotiate with your assistant, but then we ended up arranging a meeting in person. So a few weeks later, when I was in D.C. prepping for my Senate confirmation hearings, you flew from California to D.C. and arranged a meeting with me in the old executive office building. I remember there was a lot going on at that time, but I was impressed by your persistence. And I offered you a job as a junior assistant on my team. I'm sure you remember that interaction better than I did. Uh, what, what was your recollection? Well, <laughs> I remember I went in there. There's, there's this cabinet room in the old executive office building where you were camped out. Big, very prestigious, beautiful room. And I remember I launched into my pitch on why you should hire me. And you got this, you know, Hank, you know this. You're not the most patient person. So you got this expression on your face, like, boy, I don't have time for your little pitch. So I stopped my pitch mid-pitch, and then you explained to me what the job was, and you said, how does that sound? And I said, how does that sound? That sounds fantastic. Yes. <laughs> so you said, well, when can you start? And I remember I said, well, when are, when are you starting? When are you getting confirmed? And you said, well, I think I'm going to get confirmed around July 6th. I said, I'll be with you on July 6th. Uh, and that was it. Then during your first year at Treasury, you made your presence felt very quickly doing great work on an alternative energy project, which I had you present to the president. And I, I just remember how poised you were when, when answering George Bush's question. And you clearly were a quick learner and had a master, mastery of policy details. But very importantly to me, you had the self-confidence and ability to present and defend your ideas at the highest level. So when the early indications of the financial crisis emerged, and, and as I recall, that was in July of 2007, and then a French bank fund had failed, and there was an immediate liquidity crunch. So, you know, I remember interrupting a vacation in July of 2007 and calling you back to D.C. Do you remember that call? And I, I vaguely remember, I think you might have been in Tahoe somewhere and you had to drive back with two huge dogs. It was some <laughs> some unbelievable story, but you came back. Yeah, that's right. I was in Lake Tahoe. At the time, I only had one huge Newfoundland, but the, I couldn't fly him, so I had to drive back. And I thought maybe you guys were playing a joke on me. Like, you want me to be in charge of housing? I don't know anything about housing. And I think you said, yeah, but nobody else at Treasury knows anything about housing either. So we got to figure it out. Get back here. Uh, and I said, OK, I'll, I'll hit the road. So then beginning in July of 2007, you and I worked very closely together. And in the fall of 2008, so this was during the peak of the panic, you were promoted and confirmed by Congress as an Assistant Secretary of Treasury. Neil, you were by my side during that long night. You, you remember that long night in September when we negotiated the terms of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the so-called TARP. And then you were given the responsibility of standing up within a matter of weeks, the organization we are going to uh, need to implement the TARP policies, which invested $350 billion in several months to stabilize the financial system. So Neil, focus on putting together the team and the mechanism and the procedures and the processes we use to put that money out uh, very quickly, really into the banking system. What did it take to assemble that team and design a process for funding and overseeing this huge program, which was going to receive intense scrutiny? intense oversight and scrutiny. What were some of the challenges you had to overcome and, and how did you think about doing this? Well, you know, when we first were negotiating the TARP, I remember being asked by members of Congress, how many people is it going to take to run this? And we had no idea because none of us had ever done this before. And so I, I would guess, uh, I don't know, a few dozen. And within six months, you know, we hired 150 people. It was a huge, complicated undertaking. But I'd been in government for two years. We had hang together. And I knew enough to know getting stuff done in government is different than getting stuff done on Wall Street. And so there were some people in the Bush administration who were pushing us 
to populate the tarp with all of these luminaries from Wall Street. And I got in big fights with them and said, no, that is not what we need. We need people who know how to get stuff done in government because the rules are different, the processes are different. And so we ended up drafting really seasoned civil servants from around the government, from the Federal Reserve. I remember I had you call Ben Bernanke and say, hey, here are these two key lieutenants. Don Hammond was one of them. Can you send Don over to us for six months? And others, and we did that all across the government. So we ended up having a group of people with a lot of experience in government, complemented by some private sector experts and some nonprofit experts. It was the right mix of skills. And the interesting thing was the most important thing they all had in common was they were there for the right reasons. They were not there because they wanted some uh, recognition or some credit. They were there because they wanted to help the country. And it wasn't about partisan politics. Nobody asked, nobody cared what their political party was. It was, do you have the experience and are you here to work night and day to get this program up and running? And I'm so proud of the job they did. So the policy had been designed before they were there, but the idea was how do you put the money out and get it out so it's used and spent the way it's supposed to be. And to me, the, the fascinating thing about this, Neil, was we received withering criticism. You got some criticism on one particular hearing, but the criticism was about the policy. People that didn't like the fact that money was being put in the banks. But the fascinating thing, and the thing that I'm so proud of, and I know you should be, is that no program has been more highly investigated than this was. And no one could find an example of any dollar that had not come back or that had somehow been misappropriated or misspent. And as a matter of fact, the money that went into to stabilize the banks and insurance companies all came back plus $50 billion in profit. Yeah, no, that's right. And that, again, that's like, imagine standing up a government program where you're making investments in hundreds and hundreds of financial institutions, large and small, all around the country. And that's why the team did such a good job working with outside law firms, putting controls in place, tracking the dollars, making sure that we recovered the dollars. The Obama administration asked you to remain at Treasury after the 2008 election. And as I recall, you agreed to stay over and work for several months to ensure a smooth transition. Then you returned to the finance with a private sector job at an investment company, PIMCO, and then, Neil, what I like about you is you never think small. You always define your job expansively. I, I tell people that outstanding professionals define their job expansively. So what did you decide to do? You decided to run for governor of California. How old were you at the time? Uh, I think I was 39 at the time. I ran when I was 40, yeah. So challenging the, the very, very popular Jerry Brown you know, Governor Moonbeam, but he was Governor Moonbeam when he ran the first time, and he was he was a beloved governor. And what led you to run, and what did you learn? Well, I decided to run for office because I, I learned at Treasury when we were together, Hank, how important good public policy is, how much it matters for the country. And I wanted a chance to contribute again. I wanted a chance to get back involved in public policy. And while you're right, Governor Brown was very popular in many dimensions, there were huge economic challenges facing the state of California, especially around education, some of the worst education outcomes for millions of children in California and a struggling economy at the time. And so I said, hey, if nobody else is going to challenge him, I want to challenge him, but I'm going to challenge him not really on a partisan agenda, but on an agenda of economic opportunity. And I was excited about that agenda, and I, I still believe in it. So... During the campaign, you started with virtually no name recognition and very little funding. However, you waged a campaign focused on education, as you said, but as a basic civil right. You said, what's the most basic civil right? It's education. And you explained why the focus was on education. But I remember, for some reason, he, he agreed to debate you, right? <laughs> I don't know why, why he did. And that wasn't a very pleasant experience for him, because you stood up the whole time, and you made him, I guess he had to defend the teachers union out there, which was not an easy thing to do, and with the outcomes they were getting. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, for me, education is personal, because I look at the opportunities that I've had in my life as the son of immigrants. My parents were educated. They insisted that me and my sister become educated. 
And because we got educated, every door of this country has been open to me. And so, you know, I think it's a tragedy that millions of kids don't have the same opportunities that I've had just by virtue of the fact that they're not getting the education that I had. And so that's why it's a passion for me. Now, you couldn't have been very surprised when you lost to a very popular Democrat in a very blue state, right? But looking back now, are you glad you gave it a try? And Neil, what was your biggest takeaway here? And you know, I'm definitely glad I gave it a try. I met the, the widest cross-section of life you could imagine, from homeless people that I literally met who were sleeping on the street to billionaires and everything in between. And what I found is that the vast majority of people want a fair chance to work hard and get ahead. Uh, so that was inspiring at the same time. I also found that running for office is a very lonely thing because you're with people constantly. You've got advisors and you've got campaign staff, you've got supporters, but it's a solo sport. It's like being a sprinter. You're on the track by yourself, selling yourself morning, noon, and night. Well, you know, I'm, I'm energized by my message. I had the energy to do it. I didn't realize that it was such a lonely activity, even though you're with people all the time. That was a, a learning for me. And it was, it, it's very binary. You win or you lose, but you started off with like zero name recognition. And, and as I recall, you did remarkably well. You only had seven or eight million dollars in funding. And what, what was the final vote like? We got 40% of the vote at the end. And it's pretty good because at the time, the Republican registration was about 20%. 8%. So we far exceeded just the party politics, so to speak, the baseline party politics. Uh, and I'm happy about that. Obviously, you know, I'm not happy about losing, but I'm, I'm proud of the campaign we ran. I'll tell you this, there's nothing I did in my campaign that I look back and I regret having done. Uh, I didn't say things I don't believe in. And that to me was really important the whole time. Let's now switch to today and let's talk about the U.S. economy. So. How do you assess the current U.S. economy, Neil? And looking ahead, what are the major risks? Do you think it's likely that we can avoid a major recession sometime in the next couple of years? Obviously, high inflation is top of mind for everybody in the country. We were surprised at how high inflation has gotten and how persistent it has been. The economy is sending us mixed signals. So you've got these gross domestic product indicators that are showing first two quarters of negative growth, which typically indicates a recession. But so far, you've had a labor market that continues to just surprise us by creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs a month. Usually when you're in recession, you have negative GDP and you have a lot of layoffs. That's not happening yet. So we're getting mixed signals out of the economy. Our job at the Fed is clear. We need to get control of inflation. We need to bring inflation back down to 2%. We are on an aggressive path of raising interest rates to tap the brakes on the economy. I'm confident that we are going to get control of inflation and bring it back down to 2%. Whether that leads to a recession, I don't know. It's really gonna depend on, do we get some help from the supply side that has been gummed up because of COVID, because of Russia invading Ukraine and these other external factors. So Neil, do you believe, you know, hindsight's 2020, but do you believe the Fed was too slow in recognizing that inflation was going to be more than temporary? And you're thinking about inflation risk has evolved over the last couple of years. Explain that trajectory. Yeah. So, you know, before COVID hit, for the eight or 10 years before the pandemic hit, we were stuck in an economy of what Larry Summers calls secular stagnation. And I think that's the right diagnosis. Low growth, low inflation, low interest rates. And we kept getting surprised year after year after year. Every time we thought the economy was out of workers, businesses went out and created a lot more jobs and hired more people. So in the terms of monetary policy, we were coming in low in our inflation target at 2%, and we are not yet at maximum employment. Usually these two things are meant to be in tension, like a seesaw. So then the pandemic hits, you've got this big downturn, Congress steps up with a lot of fiscal stimulus. The downturn ends up being shorter than we expect because vaccines come along more quickly, which is great news. And then finally, a little over a year ago, May 2021, core inflation ticked above 2%. And at that time, the unemployment rate was 5.9%. So the question is, when should we have started tightening monetary policy? Knowing what I know now, absolutely, we should have moved more quickly. But when we had 10 years of low inflation, 
and a slack in the labor market. And then we finally hit 2% inflation and 5.9% unemployment, which is very high relative to before the pandemic. That strikes me as not necessarily responsible to at that moment just say we're in a new world. So we took a few months to say, let's see how this unfolds. By November, we were adjusting the path of monetary policy very quickly. So I understand the criticisms. With the benefit of hindsight, I definitely would have moved more quickly. But I always challenged myself to say, what did we know at the time? And were we making reasonable decisions given what we knew at the time? I still think the answer is yes. And now you are fully committed to doing what it takes to manage inflation, fully committed. So, Neil, I want to go back to education because I know this is still really important to you. And, and at the Minneapolis Fed, you've made this one of your focuses. Talk a bit about your education initiative here at the Fed. Yeah, so when I got to Minnesota, I was surprised because I knew on average, unlike California, on average, Minnesota has very good schools and very good outcomes for its students. But if you dig beneath the surface, beneath the averages, Minnesota has some of the biggest gaps between low income and middle class kids in terms of education outcomes and white children and children of color. And I wanted to understand why these gaps exist and what's been done. And what I basically concluded talking to my economists, these gaps have persisted for decades. There have been many attempts to make minor changes in education that have led to no difference in outcomes. So about three years ago, I reached out to former football great, uh, but more importantly, former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page, who's had a lifetime of passion on education. And having been a Supreme Court justice for 22 years, I asked him, is there a way we could invoke the power of civil rights to finally crack this challenge and make sure all children get a good education? And we jointly came up with a proposal to amend the Minnesota Constitution to create a civil right for every child in Minnesota. Yeah, I remember I, I grew up in Illinois as a Chicago Bears fan, and I knew Alan Page as, as that uh, opponent who was always sacking our quarterback, <laughs> one of the best defensive ends of all time. So, it, so it's interesting. So I'm aware of, aware of that initiative. But, but but also talk about what you've done right at the Fed in terms of the research you're doing on education. Yeah, so what we did at the Minneapolis Fed is I started when I started visiting low-income communities, I would start asking questions to my economists. You know, for example, Hank, black unemployment in America is almost always twice white unemployment. So if white unemployment is four, you can be pretty sure the black unemployment will be eight. And even if you do that for college graduate against college graduate it's still two times, or high school dropout versus high school dropout. It's remarkably consistent. So I asked them, why is that gap there? Why is it so consistent? And we had very few good answers. And so that led me to say, we need a research center at the Federal Reserve, bringing our research power to understand these economic disparities, not only racial disparities, but racial disparities are part of it. So I remember I went to Janet Yellen, who was then our chair, and Jay Powell, who was then a governor, and I said, we should create this research center, and I think you should create it in Washington, D.C. for the whole system. And they said, we like the research center a lot, but we think it should be in one of the reserve banks. And so we were happy to set it up in Minneapolis. And so now it's five years old. We bring visiting scholars from around the country and around the world who are experts in these topics to partner with our economists. We hired a PhD economist professor from Notre Dame, Abby Wozniak. She worked in President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. She's our director of the Institute. It's doing great work. I mean, these, these issues are decades or longer in the making. We're not going to come up with silver bullets overnight, but we are doing the important research that can lay the groundwork for future progress. That's terrific. And, and on so many issues like this, there's not a silver bullet, right? But there's what I call silver buckshot. And so I think you're going to come up with some things that will be helpful. So, Neil, now I would like to talk to you about crisis management. You and I went through the financial crisis together. And as a Fed president, you were an economic policymaker during the COVID crisis. Neil, you seem to have an affinity for crises. <laughs> Seriously, what are some of the key lessons you've learned over the course of your career about crisis management, and how can be, they be applied to other crises like climate change? And what types of crises are democracies set up to respond to? 
But let's talk, let's start off, talk about the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, and then let's just expand out from there. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I learned from you and from Ben Bernanke and Mario Draghi and others from the earlier crisis is when you face a crisis, you want to bring overwhelming force. You know, when I look back at our response to the housing crisis, I, I describe us, and this isn't a criticism, as reluctant interveners. You know, we didn't want to intervene in financial markets. We wanted markets to clean up their own mess. They took the risk. They should bear the consequences. But when finally it was clear that that was not going to work, then we just had to bring overwhelming force to stabilize the crisis. So I brought that to the COVID crisis. And one of my messages inside the Fed and to Congress when COVID hit was, it is better to err in doing too much than too little. And, and I think we internalized that lesson and I think we brought that to bear. Let me stop there, because I think one of the issues we faced during the financial crisis was it's hard to get Congress to act unless there's something immediate crisis, right? And it took a while for Congress to see it hit Main Street, right? I don't think we could have got Congress to act any earlier than we did during the financial crisis. Matter of fact, they voted down the tarp the first time. But in COVID, what you had going for you were two things. You had, first of all, so... They couldn't blame Wall Street this time, the banks, right? It hit yeah. Main Street right between the eyes. Bingo. So they needed to act. And then what you had was some of the tools that we'd used in the financial crisis that they could move out and yeah. use overwhelming force, right? No, that's right. So the, the moral hazard issue was front and center for us in 08 because everybody in the country was mad yeah. that their neighbor bought a house they couldn't afford or these banks did things they shouldn't have done. In covid it was obvious to everybody, this was a natural disaster. Nobody was at fault. Nobody behaved badly. And that's why they were getting sick. This was literally a natural disaster. So those dynamics of who's at fault and is it your own fault, those are front and center to whether or not you can get political support to do the things you need to do. And when you have something like a financial crisis or a COVID crisis, the if it's immediate, it's amazing what you can get Congress to do if it's an immediate crisis. The Fed acted so much faster in the COVID crisis because we had the experience of the 08 crisis. We had these tools off the shelf that we could, we could dust them off, implement them overnight in some cases when it took us months in 08 to design them. Yeah, and it was interesting because it was in some ways like the old days because uh, you had a number of the leaders that, that were there during the, the financial crisis. And they also remember there were certain things that were very unpopular, right? And so there's no way they were going to want to put capital in the banks again, but they saw the guarantees, right? And the exchange stabilization fund and guarantees and FDIC program to stabilize the banks. At the Fed, you guys really went big and it made a big difference. But let's talk about the kinds of things that democracies really aren't designed to, to deal with very effectively. Well, so, I think about I, something that I know is you're very focused on, the issue of climate and climate change. And the challenge, when I when I look at what we went through in 08, what we've gone through in 2020, and the, how you overlay the democracy in those decisions and in what's possible, climate is fundamentally different. It's something that's somewhat on the horizon, Although the weather patterns we're seeing now are quite terrifying around the world. But generally speaking, you think about the, the pain is going to come in the future. And yet to address it, you have to ask the people to sacrifice today. And then it gets even more complicated. So that's kind of the opposite of the, of the financial crisis, where they're feeling the pain right away. And you're saying, we're going to spend dollars and maybe your taxes will go up in the future. And so that dynamic is just flipped and it makes addressing the climate so much more difficult. The other thing you see is much, much easier to deal with a crisis if it's national than if it's global, right? Yes. And this is global. And the other thing you can see with a financial crisis, even though if you the longer you wait, the more costly it is, the government can come in at the end and clean it up, right? With money. With you know the climate crisis, where you're emitting you know, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This is a, this is very insidious. And there's the whole free rider problem. I mean, think about COVID. COVID was a global crisis, but it didn't really affect Americans very much if another country, say India, 
didn't address COVID responsibly. You know, if we could protect our people through our own policies, through fiscal support, but here we need the rest of the world to go along and to also do their part. And so there's the free rider problem, so to speak, can be a source of paralysis because if people say, well, if all if every other country isn't going to do their part, why should we do our part? And then we then we make no progress. So I'd like to not end this on such a, a downer because because there's no doubt in my view that there's a lot of risks out there, but the most certain, and it's not even a risk, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, a certainty that there's going to be adverse outcomes is climate change, which really threatens, you know, it's existential and it threatens the way we live and work and our existence on this planet. So, Neil, one of the things I like about you, you're forward looking, you take on big challenges, you're an optimist. So what cause for optimism or what hope do you have as you look at climate change, given you know, how slow democracies are to respond? Or really, not just democracies. I don't see you know leaders, no matter what the form of government, they want to stay in power, right? And so when you have to ask the population to take short-term pain for a long-term gain, that's a hard thing to do. Give me a cause for optimism. And I'll do that in one second. Let me just one more point. It's not just America that is not walking the walk. Almost every country, they talk good games on climate, but if you actually look at the sacrifices they're actually their people to make, they're minimal. And so it's not just an American problem, as I think you were just saying that. Here's my cause for optimism. The, the biggest breakthrough of the COVID crisis, positive breakthrough, were the remarkable development of vaccines. And these are true scientific miracles, because I talked to some of the best health experts in the world during COVID. And when COVID broke out, they said, we don't know if a vaccine is possible. And if it is possible, it'll probably take many, many years. And for us to have multiple highly effective vaccines within a year is absolutely a scientific breakthrough. We need our best minds in the Western world and the Eastern world working on scientific breakthroughs that can deliver clean energy cheaper so that you're not going to have to ask societies to make these draconian sacrifices. It's not easy, but if we can do it, we can actually get a control of this climate situation. Yeah, Neil, and one of the things I've seen, because I'm you know, the executive chairman now of a, a $7 billion fund focused on climate change, where we have a lot of global investors and 30 major corporates in the fund, and I'm talking to corporates all the time. And it's amazing what you see in the private sector now, even with businesses, as they see that markets are looking to the future and how important climate change is going to be, the kinds of innovation we're seeing. And so one of the strengths of America is we're great innovators and business is performing much better than government in this country. So again, there's it's just not going to be easy and we're going to have to spend a lot more money than we've been spending on this, but there is a way forward. So Neil, let's end on advice for younger listeners who are navigating their careers in this fast-moving environment. And you spend a lot of time with young people. What advice do you give someone when they come and they ask for career advice in today's world? I always say pursue things that you genuinely are interested in and have a passion for, because if you do that, you're more likely to apply yourself fully and you're more likely to be successful. Nothing opens doors for you more than just being successful in what you're doing. So I always say to people, you know, I don't really waste a lot of time networking crush your job, do a great job, and that will open doors, and then you'll go off and have better opportunities over time. And then who knows, life is long, your first job is not gonna be your last job. You can do lots of different things. I was an engineer, an investment banker, worked at treasury, private sector, now I'm at the Fed. You can do a lot of different things if you're genuinely interested in them. Amen, and I think that crush your job rather than just sort of looking around and trying to figure out if you're getting ahead or, or who in your graduating class might have been ahead of you and, and so on. There's a lot of people that get lost in the noise there. So Neil, thank you. This has been terrific. We've covered a lot of ground and you've given our listeners a lot to think about. Thanks for having me, Hank. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.